Hi friends, it's Karen from Karen Test Stuff. Bear with me here, it's been a while since I've made a video, um, but I've got some really cool stuff that I want to share with you that I've learned lately. Um, specifically from my travels to Chicago to Agile Testing Days 2023 in the US. Um, I am kind of getting back into the swing of things, so I've got a little weird computer set up. Um, this is just the way my mic works best, so hopefully it comes through clearly for you. But let's jump into it. So I went on an adventure and there are some things that I want to share with you. But first off, um, I've gone to quite a few conferences lately and all of them are life changing fantastic learning growth experiences, as well as networking opportunities. Um, but this conference in particular holds a special place in my heart. It's the first repeat conference I went to. I went last year in June of 2022, and the people that I met there changed my entire life, changed my worldview, changed my career, changed the way I think about myself and um, really provided a lot of encouragement that I needed to make some change in my life. So some of this is going to be looking back on some of the new ways that these people involved in this conference have changed my life, but also some really useful things that I learned. And you can see my journey to Agile Testing Days USA wasn't exactly a straight line. So we'll see if we hit on any of those stories as we go, but I'm excited to uh, tell you a little bit about what happened. So like I said, this was not a straight line journey. Um, I was involved last year as a volunteer, uh, so it was really hard work, but it was very rewarding um, in that I got to see how conferences work kind of from the inside as a brand new person. Um, it was the first conference I attended, like I said, so I wanted to jump in with both feet first. And the organizers of this particular conference are just second to none. They're stellar human beings and so inclusive in every way. So then I decided I wanted to get a little bit more involved. I wanted to become a speaker. So I'll share a little bit more about that journey when I get there. But first, to all of the organizers, staff, sponsors, and volunteers, thank you so much for an incredible experience. Um, you're so welcoming every year and, like I said, inclusive to everyone. Come just as you are. It's it's really a place that I feel accepted for who I am, and um, I really appreciate all of you, each of you, working individually to make that happen and as a group to ensure that we all stick to the same shared values. So, what is Agile Testing Days USA? It's a conference-ish, but it's more like an experience. It's something to experience in totality. Um from the small bonus sessions to the big party that they have. It looks like Liliana might make an appearance during the, an appearance during, during this video as well. She might come say hi. Hi, baby. Um, so Agile Testing Days USA is a sister conference to Agile Testing Days in Germany which has been going on quite a while now and is very popular in Europe. And um, I'm excited to go visit this year and speak in November. Um, but there's a third, there's a third occurrence of this Agile Testing Days Open Air, which is also occurring this year, which is a relatively new addition. Um, but this whole family of conferences is run by the same organization that really cares for people, their speakers, the the um, the attendees are very well cared for. There are very um, structured ways, <clears throat> excuse me, structured things that they have built into the conference, like uh, trusted partners that can provide safe spaces to make sure that everyone has a positive experience. 
um, or a safe experience in these types of events with lots of strangers and people that you don't know um, and unfamiliar territory. So they care very deeply about the people that are involved in making these conferences happen from the people who are paying money to the people who are being paid to be there. So um, they're just really lovely people. And I really hope everyone gets the opportunity to experience at least one of these offerings at some point. So these are all the speakers. Um, you might recognize somebody over in the far left section with glasses wearing a face mask. <laughs> That's me. I was one of the speakers this year. Sorry to my boss, John. He's uh, John Hussey's back here, and I really wanted to point him out. But uh, unfortunately, the photo that got shared on social media, we can't see him. But he's very much appreciated for being there. But most of these people are dear friends of mine, and some of them I didn't get the chance to meet in person, but hopefully we'll connect with online. And uh, just all of these smiling faces are absolutely incredible souls, and I am absolutely lucky to count myself among them. Every single day I pinch myself, I can't believe this is real. So um, there were a number of sessions that I was able to catch in between prepping for my session and in between the other social activities and honestly taking brain breaks. Um, but I wanted to kind of bring some of the highlights of some of them to you all and point out these speakers as uh, um, people that you can learn from and hopefully follow a few and some of this might spark your own creativity to uh, take these ideas and build off of them. So Jenna did an amazing keynote to kick everything off. Uh, their talk was um, Imperfect Agile, how, how we, oh, I'm struggling to paraphrase the summary of the talk, but let's just go through some of the highlights that we had. It was some of the, pointing out some of the things that um, in reality might need to be tweaked a little bit to work for your team. So they did a, um, they made a point here that I really identified with where they said sprints are not a maintainable speed, um, because we're always doing faster waterfall. It's like sprints are made to be short, fast bursts, um, not necessarily a maintainable pace that you can go over long distances. So, uh, I thought that was a really, <clears throat> A really neat point um, because in the companies that I've worked for, uh, there's always been sort of a um, a struggle to comply with strictly agile. I don't know pillars. Um, I'm not sure of the exact terminology, so if I use some things interchangeably and they're not exact, please don't hold it against me. <laughs> Um, but I don't think that we have to be super structured, um, on the timeline. It helps of course to measure things, but, um, if you're just starting out or you're still trying new experiments, there's gotta be a better way. I don't know. I don't have an answer, but it got my brain juices flowing. So, um, they also noted that during incidents, or conflicts, that there are different perspectives from management to like individual contributor level, where the management or the leadership or whoever is uh, in that kind of position has kind of a cliff perspective over the top of um, like down into the valley. Whereas the valley just sees kind of like what's in front of them in their immediate vicinity because everything else is kind of, well, you're in a valley. You can't see over the top of the next hill. Um, but the, so both perspectives have different concerns, have different risks. And um, I thought that was a really interesting way to think about perspectives, um, especially during conflict. Um the incident response plans that they mentioned, specifically the conflict res retrospectives, is something that I'd like to actually bring back to um, my company and see if there might be a space for us to experiment with 
uh, I thought it was a really cool idea to go through retrospectives when something um, happens within a team um, so that everyone can kind of get their perspective on the table and um, make sure that everyone's heard. That was very important. There was another point that they made about, uh, oh man, it was right there. That's the ADHD. Sorry, Jenna. Um, well, the next one that I was going to talk about was really important point too, that self-sacrifice serves no one in these conflict retrospectives. Um, and that, uh, that personal story that was told was very impactful to me on this particular point because it led into the idea that let there be no questions between your yes and no responses. And I forget the exact reference that that was used to, but that specific sentence has stuck with me since this presentation and it was really impactful. I really enjoyed it. So, um, I had a lot of really great takeaways from that keynote. It was a great way to start off the conference. So the next session that I sat in on was the Essential Guide to Email and SMS Testing, which was a sponsor session, I believe, with Mailinator uh, by Beth Marshall, a good friend of mine. I've done a video with her on my channel before, um, which I'll try to remember to link in the uh, comments or in the description, note to future self while editing. Um, she made some really great points about different types of testing that's available through email and SMS services with Mailinator through their APIs specifically. Um, she made a really great point that using your own device is kind of time consuming, kind of bulky. You sometimes have to have multiple devices for SMS uh, services. Um, versus doing this at the API level and having closer control, being able to do things like load testing um, and performance testing and, and ideas like that at the API level uh, without having to do it on a massive scale using your own device. Um, I think I captured the idea of that. There's so much more to it. I can't go into detail, but... Um, I just don't have time. Sorry. But uh, it was a really great presentation. If you get the chance to see um, Beth's talks on um, Postman or on, you know, these all these other topics that she works with, um, highly recommend. She's a great teacher and she's super fun to watch do her thing. Um, and then she also mentioned that they have their own uh, domains when you use their services. Um, so that's another opportunity to use for testing so you don't have to bog down your other test emails. Um, and you can view them all in a really nice dashboard. So I thought that was really great. Thanks, Beth. Oh, Joao, I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher your name. But um, Joao talked about a little less testing, a little more quality. Um this particular session, not only was it like fraught with amazing memes, um, but he really found a way to tie testing into a video game sense, which into a video game like perspective, which I really appreciate because that has always interested me. So he was talking about what we do with testing versus what our actual goal is with quality, where quality is actually the goal that has multiple dimensions. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can look at quality and testing. Um, but at the end, it boils down to all being about the risk. It's about the management of the risk, prevention, acceptance, transfer, and observing and reacting. So um, <laughs> I wish I could describe the ab the absolute like playfulness of this talk while he was going through talking about these very serious things that uh, structures that are important in quality and the roles that we serve towards quality. Um, but at the end of the day, he came back to the, the traditional, uh, definition of quality about usefulness, correctness, and goodness, giving us a good starting point for, um, what we're doing, the purpose behind what we're doing 
our whole goal for quality. So um, I thought it was a really great refresh on the basics, but with structured ways to work within um, working toward that goal of usefulness, correctness, and goodness. So thanks, Joao. I thought it was really great. And I enjoyed your, um, <laughs> I enjoyed your creativity. Oh, Erica. I met Erica in Chicago uh, a couple of months ago at Selenium Conference. And she was talking about being in a box there as well, but a little more tailored to us as automators or work in automation. This one spoke to me a little bit more as a tester at heart, bigger than the box. She spoke about quality being driven by culture champions um, or culture being driven by quality champions, excuse me. And I thought that it tied in really nicely to the talk that I watched right before that, which was Joao's talk, talking about the multifacets of quality and how we, we work in more than just testing when we work in quality. And so it was this talk was more about elevating and expanding your role so you break out of this imaginary box that either you've put yourself in or people around you have put in you into this box um being able to talk about the potential of quality socializing the potential of quality with uh diverse crafts across the aisles with developers with product with business um with all these people as a kind of an advocate which is something that i've explored on my channel which i'm really excited about and i hope you um if you haven't seen those videos uh Beth's video is one of those. And uh, she also mentioned a great point about quality being more than just the test step, which tied back in, of course, with the, you know, quality is so much more than testing. So everything, everything really flowed really nicely between these two talks. And it really gave me a chance to look at not only some comparisons between the two, but spark ideas between the two concepts. Ah, uh, Tara, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons, the battle for API. I've seen another Dungeons and Dragons talk by Tara at the Kansas City Developer Conference last year. So I was really excited for this because her creativity that she uses in the storytelling of these worlds um, between software testing and fantasy settings is uh, just it plays to my nerd heart. <laughs> So um, she mentioned that products are like dragons where there's all sorts of different types, but there are generally like groups. So you can kind of group things into things that have common behaviors. They're still going to have unique specifications and risks, but you can generally get a good starting point if you can classify them into some kind of group to start with. Um, so, you know, something that uh, in this case is, uh, specific to API testing. So it would be that API testing group of dragons. So in order to slay the dragon, you usually need to use more than one approach. Um, because she asked the audience, uh, if you were to slay a dragon, would you go with a magic user, a melee or a ranged, I think was the last one. I don't remember, honestly, and then proceeded to tell us about why the different approaches wouldn't be good for such and such dragons. It was really, really inventive. I liked it. And then uh, the most important part about doing uh, about testing or about API testing or any of their testing or software development or battling a dragon is to do it with friends. Because a team opens all sorts of diverse opportunities. It gives you more perspectives. It gives you insight into more areas of risk that you may not have considered because they're not priorities to your particular role. So um, I'm kind of adding some ideas from the other talk, I think, that she did into this talk as well. They're kind of blending in, but still, it's all really good stuff. And if you get the chance to see Tara talk, absolutely jump for it. 
Oh, y'all. Okay. All right. Let me get comfy. My first talk, the fellowship of the test in person was the most fulfilling career experience I've had to date. I got to speak on the value of community, all about who helped get me to where I am and how people can be more involved or recognizing their place that they already serve in a community um, to hopefully get a sense of belonging that I think we all need on a fundamental level um, in order to connect with people and continue growing and really thrive uh, in this space of software testing, which I described as traveling parties that are made up of different types of adventurers with weaknesses and strengths that all come with their own unique challenges. And I suggested that people in the audience think about those challenges and see if they can relate to any of them or if they might be able to solve one of those challenges for this particular type of adventurer. And I think it was really effective. Um, There was an equal mix of friendly faces that I recognized in the audience and brand new faces and Getting to connect with new people absolutely filled my heart. Um, I'm so thankful to the organizers and the uh, conference committee and the reviewers that gave me the chance to uh, do this talk in person in front of a real live audience and hopefully inspire a few people to take the next step in their journey if they're ready when they're ready. So I I just, my heart is full. Thank you, each and every person who helped me get here. Thank you. I went on right before an absolute legend. Uh, Elizabeth spoke on focus, deliver, learn, repeat. There were a few specific key pieces of this that stuck out to me that prompted some thought on my part or validated some things that I was already doing. So she spoke about being able to focus on teams, um, being able to focus their energy in the midst of distraction. Specifically, one of her ideas about pairing stuck out to me where she said that pair programming is really great for distractions because While one person can step away to deal with the distraction and then come back, the other person can continue the work that they were already doing so there's less context switching um, and less uh, downtime, like re-ramp up time. Because very much like me, she described having distractions that would uh, take her away from something And then it would take, you know, so much time to get back into whatever tasks she was doing, which is very much a struggle of mine. So um, she was also talking about learning to optimize for frequent deliveries. Um, I forget the exact context of this one, but I just know that's super validating, especially since I've felt kind of a struggle with long deployment cycles Uh, in places that I've worked um, and not always getting early access to what I need in order to test a system uh, early. So finding defaults later due to not having access early. Um, And then learning was really important. This tied into the talk that Jenna was talking about where, or the talk that Jenna was doing where they were talking about um, the conflict retrospectives and like, learning from the incident response uh, processes, having space for learning about it afterwards, and specifically pacing uh, stuck out to me with Elizabeth's talk. Pacing for retrospection and having time to extract the knowledge from those retrospections. Um, Because so often we're like, okay, we 
get our work done. Uh, is there anything else we can pull into this sprint? Okay, great. We'll be ahead of schedule. Awesome. Um, because there's always that pressure from the product side, uh, or generally there's a pressure from the product side to deliver things as quickly as possible, of course. So we lose out on a little bit of that extra time for retrospectives, um, for actually doing the learning from the ceremony, um, or just taking time to breathe. Taking time for rest is important. So I think we could all do a little bit better about the rest part, honestly, in my opinion. So the next day, uh, the first keynote was a keynote by a friend of mine, Paul. Absolutely love this guy. He's, um, he's a lot. And his presentation was a lot. And he did preface it by saying he didn't know what he was going to say. But in the end, it was really impactful. He was talking about a lot of these ideas that are supposed to like move testing forward or be the next big thing in testing and how really at the end of the day, what we need is less helpful things and more just good testing. So he was talking about how all of these different vendors are trying to sell a bunch of tools to make testing easier or make everybody a tester, but really that it's just to sell more tools um, and it's kind of deceitful marketing saying that, you know, these are low code or no code or, you know, test automation platforms that, you know, don't require any kind of setup or whatever. I, I have no dog in that fight, so don't come at me. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting perspective from the side of if we just do good testing, these things are useful, but they're not a replacement for good testing. Like automation is not a silver bullet. Um, it's helpful, but it's only as good as the tester who created it. Um, it's only going to have as much effectfulness as was written into it which is where he went with the AI and machine learning stuff as testers, where he made a great point that it's just software. Software has bugs and software needs testers um, because the AI is only going to be as good as the pattern matching is. It's not actually intelligent. It's just matching. Um, so I got a lot, about, a lot out of that. So thanks, Paul. I appreciate your spur of the moment talks generally. Um, not generally, always just, I'm, I don't know where I was going with that. Whatever. Dirty word beep out by Hall, by Paul. Um, okay. So prioritizing your tests by considering their impact and value with Larissa and Raphael. Ra Raphael? Ah, I'm sorry. I feel like that was an incorrect pronunciation. I apologize. Um, I will get you back the next time I meet you. Um, they were really fantastic, uh, not only in their session, but also throughout the whole conference, very warm and welcoming and approachable and just loved people and just always had the biggest smiles between the two of them. It was like a, a corner of sunshine wherever they were. Um, so they made some really good points about different ways you can structure prioritization, um, and different things to consider in the process. There was a really great prioritization matrix that they made with like an X and Y axis. And then you brainstorm all of the sticky notes, uh, or you put all of the sticky notes that you brainstorm for test ideas into this matrix of like importance versus, uh, or impact to the user. And I, I forget the other access off the top of my head. I should have my notes in front of me while I'm doing this. Um, but then they were able to draw kind of, um, uh, groupings on the X and Y axis for like, do now, do later, do maybe kind of a thing. It was really, really great. If you get the chance to see this talk, highly recommend. Um, and then while you were kind of plotting that, uh, Larissa made a good point about how do you know what the impact to your user is? Are you listening to the users? Do you have product forums? Do you have 
you know, user sessions? How are you gaining the information from the users about your product? And then does the impact that you're, that you may have to this user turn a pain point into a crisis in your software that specifically stuck out to me? Um, because I feel like so often we're like, well, it's going to impact, uh, a percentage of users, but how badly does that impact that percentage of users? If it's a small thing that impacts a wide variety of people or that impacts a wide percentage of users, but there's a really critical thing that's impacting a smaller subset, how do you weigh that? I thought that was really interesting. So they also mentioned that in brainstorming, only the loudest voice is heard. So that's why it's important that you brainstorm it, then vote on the test ideas plot those test ideas in that matrix I was talking about, have the ability to adjust them as you go through the process, because you're going to learn more as you go, and then assess at the end, like adjust and assess at the same time. Um, I think I got those two out of order. I think you're supposed to assess before you adjust. But either way, at the end, you want to look at the process that you've gone through and then adjust as necessary for future iterations, because it's not a static timeline. It's an iteration. And then the other thing they were talking about was when you're creating, when you're prioritizing your tests, you need to look at the feasibility for the tests. And then do you actually have what you need to test this? Like, you know, the simplest example would be like test data. Do you have the test data that you need for this? Um, so that was a really great talk and they played off each other very well. Really enjoyed that. And uh, Dr. Rochelle was absolutely phenomenal in her keynote. Oh my goodness. The why you are, there were a lot of like human skill, soft skill, people skill talks in this conference this year. And um, the whole vibe just really spoke to me because I've been doing so much like personal introspection and like personal growth goals and things like that recently that all of these discussions really had an impact on me specifically this one because it was talking about your why is not your purpose where I've been using those terms kind of interchangeably or those ideas kind of interchangeably but she was talking about your purpose is actually the outcome of your why your why is like what gives you the ability to live your life in a fulfilling way. Um, and that purpose is more along the lines of goals and having goals without a why puts you into survival mode instead of being fulfilled. So without a why... This specifically stuck with me. Without a why, others will stamp their significance on you. There were so many quotes from this session that I just that just resonated with me because she explained this by saying, no one will raise your penny to a quarter. If you present yourself as a penny, they're gonna take you as that. They're not gonna get they're not gonna take you as a quarter. You have to present yourself as a quarter for them to accept the value that you are because you have value and pretending like you don't serve no one. Don't let others stamp that penny significance on you either. Give that mess back to the people trying to imprint on you. That's on them. You know your value. You hold your value. You have your why. Um... That whole talk needs another like three hours to unpack, but I don't have time because I'm already 30 minutes into this video. Dear Lord, I'm sorry. Um, but there was just so much awesome stuff. Uh, oh, and Vernon, Vernon's talk. I run into Vernon at about half the conferences that I go to. And every time he is just the most warming, warm and welcoming big bear hug of a human being Bless your soul, Vernon. Um, he was talking about how we're setting up QEs to fail uh, because QE work 
is often underappreciated because we do a lot of glue work, the stuff to fill in the gaps, the stuff to bridge the knowledge gaps, the stuff to bridge the people gaps, do the communicating, do the uh, networking between our teams and fill in the quality work. Um, But when we burn out, going above and beyond into that glue work is really exhausting. So that kind of sparked an idea that is this what causes testers to burn out and stop doing the extra stuff, stop doing the quality stuff, the stuff that really, really puts us up above the next level um, rather than just doing the checking and the testing and um, staying in kind of our lane kind of a thing. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question and it prompted a lot of heavy thoughts. So thanks, Vernon. Appreciate you, bud. I see you. And I was really excited to get to see John's talk. I was, um, really happy that both John and I were able to, uh, not only attend Agile Testing Days together, but speak at Agile Testing Days together. Um, it was, uh, great to have an, a friend from my company there, um, who is excited about community just like I am. So he was specifically talking about a culture of accessibility within like a, like I, I took this to be like a, a community of accessibility within software development. I don't want to just say in testing because this is not just a talk for testing. This is a talk for everyone in software development. But he was talking about trying to get business priorities to align with accessibility needs, Um, telling personal stories that it hurts to see your heroes struggle with things where people that he really admired that have done superhuman things weren't able to do things like order concert tickets on an, an online service. Um, because of a disability that they had. So these these people that are doing amazing things otherwise are very limited in things that we take for granted. And trying to explain why should other people care, kind of giving, um, he gave us examples of the different types of roles within product and <clears throat> kind of showing us how to speak their language to work on alignment instead of correcting a behavior, um, giving people, you know, shared experiences that give them the reasons why they should care. And then giving us opportunities to start at the team level, like getting the question askers on board first, like our testers, um, but making sure that it's everyone's responsibility. They can be champions, but they can't do it alone. Um, we need help uh, from, and we need buy-in from everyone. So, um, but just getting one person excited is the first step. So thanks, John. Uh, another one that ties into the conflict resolution idea that's been spinning in my brain the entire conference was feedback techniques for transparent teams from D. And D used a lot of references from a ton of different source material. Um, if you want to know books on the subject or frameworks on the subject, she is definitely the person to go to. She had a ton of awesome stuff. Um, but one of the specific things that she referenced was the feedback quadrant um, that talks about the four different quadrants of feedback uh, types from ruinous empathy to radical candor to manipulative, manipulative insincerity and obnoxious aggression. I immediately identified with ruinous empathy because I hate confrontation. So I will do everything that I can to try to make people feel good about the bad news that I have to bring to them instead of just giving them the bad news and just getting it out of the way. So that's where I find myself. Um, she gave us some tips for how to handle feedback or how to give feedback. Like specifically something that stuck with me was if you're going to get defensive about the answer that you get, just don't ask the question. Don't, don't, don't ask, don't ask for feedback. Um, and that the receiver of the feedback is the important person. Um, when you're giving feedback, it's, it tied back to something that Jenna said, where they said, uh, that the, the intent 
is not the important part. It's the impact that's the important part. I'm paraphrasing, but basically the receiver is the important person. doesn't matter what you intended to say. It's the impact that your words had on that person. And then some questions to ask yourself uh, while giving and receiving feedback was like, how does what does getting what I want look like? How How is this going to help us move forward? How am I going to get to my goal with this? And then if you can't answer that question, do I need to say this or is it really just for me? That had a big impact on me too. Thanks, Dee. Ah, and then to wrap out the entire conference, the last keynote by Mel the Tester, The Secret to My Success. This was a very personal story that she to- that, that Mel told, and I really don't want to tell this story. I just want to say that this keynote had such an impact on me coming from a background like mine. Um, I shared some very parallel experiences, like growing up in kind of weird, um, no, not weird. I don't know why I said weird. I I meant to say something like non-traditional, like growing up in kind of a non-traditional way. It's not the, the happy story that you think of, um, uh, like in my teenage years and stuff. And it's, it's a long story. So is Mel's story. Needless to say, I identified 100%, absolutely loved it. The, the stories that Mel told about the people who gave her a chance, the people who made a difference, the choices that made a difference, that made an impact, the, the key nexus points that changed the career journey that they were on. Um, it was really impactful. And it inspired in me a courage to make change in my life as well, uh, positive change, and to take time for rest in the in the in between cycles, um, because that's very important as well for mental health. And basically, the takeaway that I took from Mel's talk was almost the very first sentence from the talk is that the checklist to happiness isn't magical. It's not like you get a courier, you get your dream house, you get married, you get happy. You choose your own checklist. Everybody's is a little different. And I love that message. Thanks, Mel. So that's everything for now. Um, I... I'm going to break my equipment right here at the end of everything. Woohoo. Uh, if you stuck with me till the end, I hope you really enjoyed a lot of these takeaways uh, and that they inspire some ideas within you to go and research. Or if you get a chance to experience any of these talks with people, I highly recommend it. Um, I hope that uh, if, if Agile Testing Days USA comes back in 2025, Hopefully that's the plan anyway, what I hear, um, that everyone will take the opportunity to experience this, especially if you haven't before, um, especially if you're a new tester, if you're scared to go to other big conferences or um, other spaces like this, please give this a chance. They're beautiful people and they really do accept you as you are. At any level, whether you're an expert or a novice, nobody cares. They just want you to come learn with us. So I hope that you do. I hope you enjoyed this. And I love you all so much. This has been Karen Test Stuff. Bye-bye.